Welcome to the ninth video in the series on the history of astronomy. Europeans are slowly coming on to the astronomy scene, or I should say Christian Europeans, as the Greco-Romans were once heavy hitters in the field, but the Christian world had forgotten about that, and they start to make a comeback entirely as a result of contact with the Muslim or Arab world. During the second half of the Islamic Golden Age, scientific knowledge very slowly trickles into Europe. And this happens because Europeans start to translate Arabic texts into Latin. The first record of this, that I know of, comes from Pope Sylvester II, who had spent a lot of time studying in Spain, which at the time was predominantly under Muslim rule. And there he had picked up a fascination for Arabic numerals and Arabic mathematics and astronomy. And he tried to advocate bringing this into Europe. Unfortunately, it didn't really stick. Subsequent popes were not very happy with him for promoting what they called Muslim science. In Europe, the powers that be, for the most part, are not interested in bringing in Muslim ideas into a Christian Europe. The translation of Arabic texts into Latin is largely carried out by individuals who came into contact with the Muslim world and became fascinated with their knowledge. One example was Adelard of Bath. He spent some time traveling around the Muslim world and started to translate texts from Muslim polymaths, such as Al-Khwarizmi. Now, he also translated Euclid, who was Greek, but it had been translated into Arabic, and he finds out about it through the Arabs. So he's translating Euclid from Arabic into Latin. He also writes a guide on how to use astrolabes, which was the standard tool used by Muslim astronomers. Roger II of Sicily also takes a great interest in the knowledge of the Muslim world. This is not that surprising as Sicily for a long time had been under Muslim rule. Roger II is the first European ruler to use Arabic numerals in an official capacity. He prints them on his coins. Now I'm calling them Arabic numerals and some of you are probably yelling they're actually from India and that's correct. The decimal system originates in India and was adopted by the Arabs. However, the actual symbols that the Europeans adopt were developed in the Maghreb, that is the western half of the Muslim world, northwestern Africa. And the Europeans didn't know these numbers originated in India, so they called them Arabic numerals. So I'm just going to call them Arabic numerals here. But yes, the mathematical system comes from India. More texts are translated by Herman of Corinthia from a number of Muslim polymaths, this time Ptolemy is also translated. Again, Ptolemy wrote in Greek, but his texts come to Europe through the Arabs. Another important figure in this translation movement is Gerard of Cremona. We know of some 87 books that he translated. More texts by Muslim polymaths are translated by Plato of Tiburtinus, as well as John of Seville. As you can see, these are just individuals who happen to have taken interest in the scientific and mathematic knowledge of the Muslim world. Now we come to a guy you've probably all heard of, Fibonacci. He came into contact with Arabic numerals and Arab math in general because his father was an Italian merchant who spent a lot of time in North Africa. And as a merchant, you need to be able to balance your books. And so they very quickly realized Arabic numerals, the Hindu system, is far superior for calculating to what was being used at the time in Europe, which were Roman numerals. I challenge you to do very basic arithmetic using Roman numerals. If you're finding this video interesting so far, please just take a second to like and subscribe, maybe share with some friends, leave a comment. And if you'd like to support the channel, I'll have a link to my Ko-fi page at the end of the video. You can also find it in the description. We now come to a guy named Michael Scott. No, not that Michael Scott who also played an important role in bringing in Arabic numerals to Europe. He also took an interest in alchemy, which is the precursor to modern chemistry. Eventually, enough translations are made that Europeans start practicing science for themselves. Robert Gross Test is one of the first Europeans we know of to advocate for the scientific method, which he picked up from the Middle East. Specifically, he got it from Al-Haytham, who was one of the most famous Muslim polymaths in Europe. Another famous figure advocating for science was Roger Bacon, who dabbled in a little bit of everything, much like the Muslim polymaths. One of the first European astronomers was Regiomontanus. Not much is known about Regiomontanus, 
but from what we have, it would appear that he may have been a supporter of a heliocentric model for the solar system. Shortly after him comes a figure you've probably all heard of, Nicholas Copernicus. He actually studied at the same place as Regiomontanus, and he makes a big bang in European astronomy with his famous book De Revolutionibus Orbium Collectium, which just means the revolution of celestial spheres, or something like that. In this book, he presents his famous heliocentric model of the solar system. Now, he's not the first person to think of this. This idea goes all the way back to ancient Greece with Aristarchus of Samos, and a number of Muslim astronomers had tried it out as well. In fact, he likely got the idea from them and was convinced by it, as he used Muslim star charts, so he definitely had contact with the Muslim world. We have further evidence of this, as in his book he discusses the 2C couple, which I talked about in the last video. In fact, his schematic for this principle is identical to al Tusi's, right down to the letters. You can't really see in this image, but the letters used by Copernicus on the right are the same letters used by al Tusi, just the Latin version, where al Tusi used Arabic letters. We now come to a guy named Tycho Brahe. He builds the first and only mural sextant observatory in Europe. Now the way this was presented to me in my first astronomy class was that mural sextants were his brilliant idea. But if you've been watching this series, you'll know that the Arabs had them at least 700 years before him. Now having said all that, Tycho Brahe's mural sextant may have been the most precise ever built. At the very least, it was on par with the best mural sextants in the Arab world. And that's because after he dies, his assistant Johannes Kepler uses the data from this observatory to actually solve the problem of planetary motion. But we're not there just yet. Tycho Brahe comes up with his own model of the solar system, which is sort of a mix between heliocentric and geocentric models. In his model, the planets all go around the sun, and then the sun goes around the earth, as does the moon. This is kind of interesting because this model is essentially a heliocentric model from the point of view of someone on earth. So he's got this model, he's got his observatory, but he ends up dying before he can actually make use of his data. And so the work in this observatory is passed on to Kepler. But before that comes Galileo Galilei, and he revolutionizes the world of astronomy and physics. In physics, he demonstrates experimentally the concept of inertia. This idea had already been proposed by the Persian slash Arab Muslim polymath Ibn Sina but he demonstrates it experimentally. He runs an experiment with a series of ramps where he has a ball roll down a ramp and then come up another ramp on the other side. And he plays around with the angles of these ramps. And he notices that no matter what the angle of the ramp, the ball always comes back to the height it started at on the initial ramp. So he discovers the ball will only slow down if it goes back up a ramp and it will stop only if it gets back to the same height. So then he asks, what happens if there is no ramp on the other side? What's the ball going to do? Well, it's never going to stop or slow down. It'll just keep going at the same speed until something brings it back up to the same height. And so the concept of inertia is proved experimentally. He also shows that all objects fall at the same rate. Prior to this, at least in Europe, it was thought that heavier objects fell at a faster rate. This is what Aristotle had proposed. Galileo first argues that this must be true logically. So let's go over his argument. He starts off by saying, let's assume that it's true that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. If I then drop two objects, a heavy one and a light one at the same time, the heavy one should fall faster. Now he says, instead of just dropping two balls, let's first attach them with a small string. The heavier ball is now going to be pulled back by the lighter ball that doesn't want to fall as fast. So it's not going to fall as fast as when it wasn't tied to the smaller ball. Conversely, the smaller ball is now being pulled down by the bigger ball, so it's going to fall faster than when it was detached. Since the two balls are attached to one another, they must both fall at the same rate, which is going to be between the rate of the big ball by itself and the little ball by itself. But wait. Now that these two balls are attached, we actually have one object that's heavier than the larger ball. And so it should fall faster than the big ball by itself. So apparently, by attaching these two balls together, they will simultaneously fall faster and slower than the larger ball by itself. 
so we have a logical contradiction. Therefore, it cannot be that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects, so everything must fall at the same rate. He does a number of experiments demonstrating this, including supposedly dropping two balls off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I don't know if he actually did this or if this is just a story. Now Galileo made his money by building telescopes and selling them to the military. And one day he has the idea to take one of these telescopes and point it at the stars. And this changes the world of astronomy forever. This is in fact why Tycho Brahe's mural observatory was the only one built in Europe. Because right after he built it, Galileo figures out we can look at the stars with telescopes and mural sextant observatories become obsolete. Using his telescope, he makes a number of astronomical discoveries. He takes a look at the sun and discovers the sun has sunspots. He doesn't actually look at the sun through his telescope, he projects it onto the wall. Now he's not actually the first person to discover sunspots, they were first observed by ancient Chinese astronomers. But Galileo doesn't know about this, he discovers them independently. He also notices that Jupiter has four moons orbiting it. Now Jupiter actually has like a hundred moons, but it's got four big ones. And that's what Galileo saw, and these moons today are called the Galilean moons. And actually one of these moons may have also been observed by an ancient Chinese astronomer, although this is highly debated. If you want to know more about ancient Chinese astronomers, you can watch my video on astronomy in ancient China. You may not think this, but this was a big deal, because it showed that at least some things out there don't orbit the Earth. And at the time, the official position of the church was, everything orbits the Earth, it's the center of the universe. He then takes a look at Venus and observes that Venus goes through a full set of phases. And this proves that Venus does not orbit the Earth, because this is impossible in a geocentric model. Actually, if you want to be pedantic about it, it's impossible if you add the condition that Venus is always seen in the same direction as the Sun, which is true. And this does not go over well with the religious authorities. And actually, church opposition to scientific progress starts well before Galileo. It starts all the way back going to Pope Sylvester II. Not Sylvester II himself, he was a big proponent of bringing science from the Middle East into Europe, but that ended after him. He was portrayed in a negative light by subsequent popes. During the time when Europeans were translating Arabic texts into Latin, the church was opposed to the use of Arabic numerals, which it deemed to be satanic. These evil numbers were somehow going to cast spells on people, and on numerous attempts it tried to ban them. But the fact is, this just didn't take. Pretty much everyone who even tried using them realized this system is far superior to Roman numerals. They also tried to ban what they called Islamic sciences, which was essentially a blanket term for anything coming in from the Middle East. On three separate occasions, the University of Paris was officially condemned by the church for teaching and promoting these Arabic numerals and Islamic sciences. And of course, these condemnations often came with book burnings. If you've been watching this series, you'll know this is not the first time this has happened. In Europe, the bulk of that was done for obvious reasons in Spain, during the period that is sometimes called the Reconquista. The concept of Reconquista is not historically accurate, but that's a whole nother story. And most of this destruction happens at the very end during the Spanish Inquisition, where apparently it's estimated that somewhere around a million books were destroyed. It's important to point out that these orders to destroy books only came from higher up. The monks in these monasteries in Spain did everything they could to secretly save books. So far most of this was done by the Catholic Church, but the Protestants weren't much better. This started because Martin Luther condemned heliocentrism, and specifically he did this as a response to Copernicus, calling his idea preposterous and contrary to the Bible. Well, as a result of that, later Protestant leaders were opposed to heliocentric theory, and they condemned Johannes Kepler for this. But this didn't stop Kepler, and he was eventually officially excommunicated for his views on the moon. He had made the sinful mistake of claiming that the moon is a solid body, and even wrote some sci-fi stories about people living on it. Well, I guess the Protestant church was opposed to this, as they were claiming the moon is pure light and pure light cannot be a solid, and apparently that's grounds for excommunication. Finally, we come to Galileo, 
who was put on trial and excommunicated by the Catholic Church. Now, we have to set the record straight here. We're generally told he was excommunicated for saying that the earth moves. That's partially true, but Galileo presented his ideas in the ancient Greek tradition. He set up a story with characters, and each character represented a certain point of view. And he gave one of his characters the name of a cardinal, and that character happened to be the idiot in his story who was wrong about everything. So yes, he's been excommunicated for saying the earth moves, but also because he's essentially making fun of the Catholic Church. So he's forced to repent and take back his heliocentric views, and you've probably all heard the famous story that he said, but it still moves, which probably never happened, as the first record of this comes from something like a hundred years after he died. Now, while the higher-ups in the church were most of the time in opposition to scientific progress, we have to be fair again and historically accurate, local monasteries played an important role in funding the translation of Arabic books into Latin. You see, monks in monasteries who don't have any power, they're just humble monks, one of their jobs was to write and copy books. So they like books, they're interested in books, they're artists who make books. They're looking at these books from the Arab world, and they're fascinated. They want to know what's in them. They want to see how they make them. They want to copy them. They want to learn from this advanced civilization that has thousands and thousands of books filled with this Arabic calligraphy and artwork and who knows what knowledge. So monks and monasteries actively translated and or funded the translation of Arabic texts into Latin. In fact, many of these early translators were actively supported and funded by their local monastery. So we have to give credit where credit is due. Now that Galileo is on the scene, the debate between Ptolemy and Copernicus is in full force. And I should point out here that this geocentric model on the left here is often called the Ptolemaic model, but this is not actually Ptolemy's model. Ptolemy's model, while it was geocentric, was more complicated than this. And if you'd like to know how it worked, I covered it in my video on astronomy during the Greek Golden Age. This debate was started back in ancient Greece and kind of died down with Ptolemy, as Ptolemy's model worked quite well. But by the time the Arabs come around, it becomes evident that Ptolemy's model doesn't work. But saying that the model is wrong is one thing. It's another thing to find a better model. And the Arabs threw pretty much everything they had at this problem, but were never able to solve it. And now this problem has been passed on to Europeans. Well, after some 2,000 years, figuring out just how do the planets move would finally be solved by Johannes Kepler. And we'll take a look at his discovery and his three laws of planetary motion in the next video. So if you enjoyed this video and would like to see the solution to planetary motion, please be sure to like and subscribe, hit the bell to be notified for the release of the next video, and if you'd like to support the channel, I'd be most grateful if you can go to my Ko-fi page or you can just leave me a super thanks. Thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.